Many well-known historical figures from throughout human history have earned their place in historical records by accomplishing something great. From Columbus to Armstrong, one thing they both have in common is that they would both be responsible for accomplishing a great feat. These men have become cemented in history through their accomplishments whether they wanted it or not. Following his journey to the moon, Neil Armstrong would become an overnight celebrity, conducting a multi-week tour around the world to celebrate his accomplishment. When asked about his celebrity status in a 2005 interview, Neil seemed entirely disappointed interested, chalking his great accomplishment up to circumstance and downplaying the significance of his role. You were the first. You were chosen to do that. That's special. Yeah, I wasn't chosen to be first. I was just chosen to command that flight. Circumstance put me in that particular role. That wasn't planned by anyone. Most men will never have an opportunity to enter the history books, but of those willing to try, one of the most fascinating has to be the story of Canadian stunt driver Ken Carter. <laughs> I still believe that Evil Knievel is the second best deer devil in the world. And uh, I say that because I feel that I'm number one. I, feel, I also feel that if you, don't think, if you don't think in terms of win, you do not win. Ken Carter, real name Kenneth Gordon Polishek, was born in 1938 in Montreal, Canada. Born into a working class family in the slums of Montreal, to say his economic future looked bleak would be a bit of an understatement. He would spend his childhood exploring the alleyway behind his apartment building. This would instill a sense of discovery in Ken that would undoubtedly influence the direction of his life. At the age of 16, Ken would join a group of traveling Canadian daredevils where he would gain his first real experience as a stunt driver, performing multiple motorcycle ramp jumps. But after a brief run of only three weeks, Ken would break his leg, the first injury of many to come, and would be left behind as the group of daredevils moved on. Though this accident would cost him months of recovery, Ken would not be deterred from continuing his pursuit, and would go searching for another group of daredevils as soon as he was able. Ken would run with a few different daredevil groups for the remainder of his teenage years. He was learning the ropes, picking up a few of the usual stunts, and gaining a reputation. Eventually, Ken would go his own way and start running his own show, traveling across the continent. He was building a big reputation, and people were starting to recognize him. Somewhere along the way, he would pick up the nickname of the Mad Canadian for his death-defying stunts. Though this may seem like a typical Daredevil nickname, it may have proven to be more accurate than anyone could have predicted. By the mid-1970s, Ken had built a name for himself, having reached the point in his career where he could afford to take the back seat and allow younger drivers to perform jumps in his place. An impressive feat that few stunt drivers have accomplished. Had he simply continued down this path, he likely would have been able to retire and live out the rest of his days in peace as yet another legendary stunt driver. After performing several hundred jumps throughout his career, you'd think after a while the thrill of the jump would start to wane, and that assumption may prove to be correct, as in 1976, Ken Carter would announce his most ambitious project yet, to jump a mile. You know, it's just like the business, you know, like 15 years ago, I remember guys going over the Niagara Falls in a wheelbarrow. Who wants to do that? I mean, you really, you know, I'd go and see that. And, but then the moment somebody got dead, I think I'd never go back. You know, I mean, we want to say, well, why would he do that? You know, and then you got Petit Philip who walks across Paris. You know, that'd be nice to see. But gee, if he ever fell, I think I'd close my eyes. Television broadcaster ABC would provide Ken with a contract worth 250,000 US dollars to construct a 1400 foot takeoff ramp in Morrisburg, Ontario. The contract also included that the stunt would air on ABC's television series The Wide World of Sports on September 25th. The jump would involve crossing the St. Lawrence River from the Canadian side and landing on a small island on the American side of the river. It's important to note that at its deepest point, the St. Lawrence River is 250 feet deep, or about 76 meters, meaning that if the car were to undershoot the target, Ken would be diving deep into a river while strapped into the seat of a rocket car. But Ken wasn't concerned. He had finally done it. His dream of jumping a mile was finally becoming a reality. Few men get the opportunity to enter the history books, but it looks like Ken Carter was about to get his opportunity. Due to an intense amount of rain over the Morrisburg area, construction had to be repeatedly delayed. ABC was starting to get fed up with the lack of progress, 
and decided to send famous stuntman Evil Knievel to inspect the construction site and report on the progress being made. Upon arrival, Evil would quickly come to the conclusion that the stunt would not be possible, citing insufficient levels of preparation. The weather has been bad, the runway is muddy, the takeoff ramp is not built. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. I think it's much more dangerous than the Snake River Canyon stunt, and I think that the time and preparation that's been put into it is much too little. Meanwhile, the next step of Ken's journey would take him to Lou Arrington, a rocket car enthusiast. Ken needed to get comfortable with traveling at such an incredible speed, as up until now, Ken had never gone faster than 90 miles per hour. After performing a total of six runs, Ken would cap out at a top speed of 255 miles per hour, well beyond any speed he had ever gone before. With four days to go, ABC was getting nervous. Reports from the construction site, as well as safety concerns from car designer Richard Keller, ultimately caused ABC to cancel the jump and abandon the project. Thank you, Sid. <clears throat> you know, uh, I find it difficult probably for the first time in my life, to be able to stand here and uh, talk to you gentlemen of the press, ladies, because I, I tell you now that I know that uh, the jump, in almost any one of my jumps, record jumps, whether it be Islip, New York, or Houston Astrodome, is dangerous. And I know for a fact that Morrisburg could have probably been more dangerous than any one of them, but that's a a fact of my life and I went out this weekend and got into a rocket powered car called Captain America and ran and set a Canadian track record of 255 mile per hour in six seconds if you think that ain't a rush for a stranger I got some news for you and I've done all of this I'm 38 years old and I can't even my jumps of the past few years haven't been up to par and I know that I'm getting a little old for this business Despite the setback, Ken would continue to search for backers and within a few months, construction was back up and running. After making a deal with some Canadian businessmen, a new construction crew would take over the project and the car would also be handed off to a new team of designers. The car would quickly prove to be in some ways more of a liability than the ramp. During a pressure test of the fuel tank, the tank would explode, blowing off the front end of the car. This would set back the construction of the car significantly as several more tests would also result in similar explosions. This combined with the slow speed of construction at the jump site would cause the upcoming jump to be cancelled. Over the winter, Ken would go down to Florida bringing the car with him in search of new fuel tanks. After acquiring the tanks, the car was finally ready to go, and a new jump would be scheduled for July. But the backers were running low on money, and while Ken was busy negotiating, Stunt driver Sammy Miller would take Ken's place in testing the fully built vehicle. While the test definitely could have gone a lot worse, it would still be hard not to call this a failure. As the car went back into the shop for repairs, Ken was wrapping up negotiations with the backers. Though Ken was committed to putting his own money on the line, it simply wasn't enough to meet the July deadline and the jump was yet again cancelled. Things were getting desperate, and the backers were still struggling to raise enough money. Originally, Ken wanted a live audience of roughly 100,000 people. But with barely enough money to finish the ramp, this idea was shot down in favor of pre-recording the jump and selling it to television networks. Ken wasn't happy with the change, but accepted it as a necessity. As the new September deadline approached, it was all hands on deck at Morrisburg. Everything was nearly ready, the ramp was practically finished, and the car had finally arrived at the site. But before the jump could be performed, a few tests had to be conducted. The most important of these tests being a dry run of the launch sequence. Ken would step into the car and accelerate partway up the ramp before stopping. From the moment Ken stepped out of the vehicle, you could tell something was off. 
Up until now, all of Ken's tests had been performed at racetracks. This kept Ken's mind off the jump and focused more on the speed of the vehicle, but being forced to stare down the path he had created for himself may have made Ken finally start to understand the true severity of the stunt he was trying to perform. Uh, uh, hey, Sammy. <laughs> I was looking for my white line. <laughs> I got late on everything. Really late. Yes. Uh, you know, that's, I got to go by Mark's in the highway. I can't. I. It I'm ran out of fuel. Right no, no, it ran, ran out, out of fuel right where I told you. No, no, it ran out of fuel. Right where right I told you. said it would run. It did. I got by him, but I didn't get to shoot out at all. Well, not until not, I was late getting it out. Well, that's okay because you're a jump man. You're not a race car driver. Everything was fine. The car looked fine. It handled fine. I didn't want you to experience the bump and the ramp till we worked yeah, on it tonight. But it's fine. Car, right. car handled well. Right. You're right. Fine. You're right about that. You know. I didn't car. want you to feel the bumps. It got lift. Yeah, but you see, you, you're not under power. See, at that point, you're just coasting and rocking and weaving. When you're under power, you won't feel it because the power's planting you. It's going to drive you. You won't even. It'll be like this under power, where it was like this just then. Okay. Under power, it's going to be like this. All right. You won't even notice. First hip, first hop, and before you realize it, you're off the end of the ramp. But Fine. I, I need them white lines. <laughs> well, you don't need them because tomorrow you have white lines. You'll be off for whenever. Next month, whenever you can do it, the parachute gets here, you'll be off. Jumping a mile in a rocket car is no small feat, and there's a reason why no one has ever done it before and why no one has tried to do it since. It simply isn't possible. Even if you could make a rocket car capable of traveling a mile, once you factor in the size of the ramp you would need, not to mention the incredibly bad aerodynamics of a car in flight, the stunt quickly becomes far too outrageous for any reasonable person to take it seriously. And even Ken was starting to come to this conclusion, whether he wanted to accept it or not. I've worked on it for five years, and yet we had a press conference here, fired that car on the ramp, and there was nobody here. I mean, if something's wrong. I hold a press conference in Los Angeles, and it hits the front pages all over the world. We hold a press conference in Morrisburg, and nobody shows up. What the hell am I doing? I'm fixing to, to get in this car, and who knows, get dead for, for all I know. I could be dead at the end of that ramp. Though the jump was imminent, the money problems had grown far too out of control. In an effort to secure more funding, Ken made a secret deal with a group of Hollywood executives which included rights to the recording. This caused the previous group of backers to pull out entirely. Come launch day, the local population was more than willing to cooperate, with firemen and police officers on site. Even the Seaway authorities agreed to halt shipping during the launch window. But as the car was being prepared for the jump, the crew was refusing to work, demanding $27,000 for them to continue working. As the backers searched for the money, the hours began to drag on. Eventually, the Seaway authorities would resume shipping, limiting the timeframes available for the launch to occur, as now they had to wait for the river to be clear of ships before they could perform the stunt. The delays had cost them too much time. At 6.45, Ken would finally get a chance to jump. But within only five seconds of the launch, it would be aborted following a pressure leak. By now, it was far too dark out for another attempt to be made, and the jump was cancelled. Following the abort, Ken was visibly shaken by the experience, and I think this is the moment where Ken fully understood the danger of the jump. But he was in far too deep to back out now. The ramp was finished, and the backers were getting frustrated. The only thing Ken could do was try to buy himself more time. One week later, the jump was back on, though this time, Ken seemed entirely disinterested in whether or not the crew actually made any progress in preparing for the event. The locals don't seem interested either. This time, instead of a full team of firemen, there is only one guy with a tow truck and a water can. Despite the lack of enthusiasm, the car is ready to go, but Ken begins stalling for time. He spends nearly 45 minutes checking the walkie-talkies, going over the launch sequence, adjusting the safety straps, and generally trying to waste as much time as possible. Eventually, it starts to rain and the jump is cancelled. The backers are fed up with Ken and feel that he's lost his nerve. While Ken celebrates the cancellation, the backers begin hatching a plan. Yet another rainy day in Morrisburg, but the backers have had enough. Ken has stalled for too long, and the backers have decided to go ahead with the jump anyway, with or without him. As Ken is busy negotiating with some of the backers in Ottawa, the jump in Morrisburg is a go, with American stunt driver Kenny Powers taking Carter's place at the wheel. 
but with rain closing in, the crew had to work quickly. There would be no stalling today. The jump was a complete failure. Kenny Powers would miraculously survive only having broken a few ribs, with the total travel distance of the flight estimated to be about 506 feet or about 154 meters, definitely well short of a mile. What happened today and why you weren't there? Um, you started off with the Charlie Fisher this morning? No, there was supposed to be a meeting last night, and I didn't want to meet last night. I wanted to spend some time with the crew because we knew bad weather was coming. You know, I want to spend some time with the guys, so we did. We had dinner, and I made arrangements to meet with Hugh Kennedy and Charlie Fisher this morning at 8.30. We met. We discussed the possibility of the European tour, and we got into the fact that the people in Europe didn't want me to get hurt, and they didn't want me going over there in a wheelchair. And right then I got the idea of what they were saying. What they were saying was they wanted somebody else to jump that ramp. Yeah. Did they ask you about that? Did they ask you about Ken Powers? Oh yeah. They no. They never mentioned Ken Powers. They mentioned the fact that they wanted to uh, they wanted to uh, have somebody else jump. And then I mentioned. I said, Are you talking about Kenny Powers? Yeah. And they said yes. I said I said to him, He's not qualified. He's not qualified to jump. He's a good stuntman, but he's never been over 100 mile an hour, and he's never been in that car at 260 mile an hour. You think that was dangerous for them to do that? Yes. Definitely. It was wrong. It was definitely wrong. I'm not going to sit here and say to you that what happened to Kenny Powers would not have happened to me. Ken had gotten what he wanted. He managed to evade the most dangerous stunt of his career, a jump that very well could have led to his demise, but he couldn't let it go, and the failure would make him more obsessed with the jump than ever before. The ramp site would quickly be abandoned, for the last time. Any possibility of a backer willing to invest in the stunt immediately evaporated following the Kenny Powers jump. Ken would leave too, heading back on the road to try and attract more investors. Though his next big jump wouldn't be the mile, it would be a new world record. This jump would take Ken to Cayuga International Speedway, where he would successfully set a new world record for the longest rocket-powered car jump. Though the jump was successful, it did little to attract investors, and so Ken was back on the road planning yet another jump, just as he had done so many times before. Ladies and gentlemen, you were a witness to a world record. Now let me tell you what happened. The car was running until it got out of the turn, and I tell you truthfully, it ran out of gas. It ran out of gas in the turn, I asked for a push, but the car did run. I got him to give me a push rather than bring, turn it around where it was. We're going to make a measure. We've got a world record here. All we have to do is measure it, Bob. Please measure it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Did you enjoy that jump? All right. <laughs> Ken Carter's final jump would take him to Peterborough, Ontario. The goal of the stunt was to jump over a small pond just outside of town. The car being used for the stunt would be a modified Pontiac Firebird. Though this car would be more aerodynamic than the Lincoln used on the St. Lawrence jump, it was still going to fly like a brick, and no amount of modifications were going to change that. When they say zero, 
I'll hit that rocket car back on that ramp. Come down the 300-foot runway to the edge of this pond where it'll be a 12-foot high ramp, 60 feet long. I'll hit that ramp at 100 mile an hour. Climb to an altitude of approximately 45 feet in the air over the pond. During the first attempt, Ken would accidentally lose control of the vehicle and the car would fly off the ramp sideways, smashing front end first into the pond. Ken would quickly be recovered by a team of divers, and amazingly, he had managed to survive completely unscathed. Unfortunately for Ken, his luck had finally run out. We'll be back Labor Day weekend, and I'm going to get this car across this pond. I swear to you, I will. In the early morning hours of September 4th, 1983, Kenneth Gordon Polishek would blast off a ramp going over 100 miles per hour. This speed was well beyond the speed required for the jump, causing the car to overshoot the target ramp and land on its roof. The reason for the overshoot is because Ken insisted on using more fuel than the jump called for, believing the lack of power was responsible for the failure of his first attempt. Ken would quickly be recovered and loaded into an ambulance, but it was too late. By the time Ken arrived at the hospital, he was already dead. According to several attendees of the event, Ken Carter had actually appeared quite nervous prior to the jump, with some going as far as to say that he didn't even want to do it. He wasn't showing that confidence that he had the first time. I don't think he was ready. Yeah, he was nervous. Very mellow, uh, almost non-committal. Uh, certainly the talk at the time was he was under some sort of tremendous pressure that he had to go. I think that he thought he couldn't do it, whether he had a premonition or what it was, but I just felt that, I, I don't think he wanted to do it. It's hard to say what exactly motivated Ken Carter to do the things he did, and as far as anyone knows, he could just be insane. I mean, imagine waking up one day and believing that jumping a mile in a rocket car would be a good idea. But you have to remember where he came from. Growing up in the gutter can make anybody desperate, and many of the most successful celebrities and entrepreneurs of today are people who came from nothing. The story of Ken Carter is the story of an underdog, from the slums of Montreal to world record jumps. Ken Carter spent five years pursuing the jump of a lifetime, only to sabotage himself at the last moment. At the height of his career, the only thing he needed to do was perform the jump. Regardless of whether or not it was successful, it certainly would have cemented his legacy as a legendary stunt driver. After all, that's what he wanted, right? For the life of me, even then, this portion of this yard was always blocked off. We could never get up on top of this roof and play, and if you did, it was a no-no. And I guess why I used to think that maybe this is where the rich people lived. You know, used to pile the orange crates over here and just get up there. Maybe it was because it was boarded and you, and you weren't allowed up there. It's because we really wanted to go. I'm a healthy specimen, and this is where I came from. And there's nothing the matter with this place. And you know, and this is how I feel about it. You know, and I get somebody asked me about what about your what about your childhood? What about it? You know, what about the skinny, skinny cross-eyed, bow-legged kid that used to play in his backyard? And now I'm sitting on the threshold of life. And this was home. It's a funny feeling going through me right now. We had bunk beds up here where we could all get in. And then we turn around, and here we used to sit and fight to look out the window. And in the evening, of course, it was a pretty sight, too, because it was a cross up there that lit up. And the cars going up and down over the bridge. And, but right out here, we used to sit and fight to see who's going to look out the window. And I really don't know at what. I, I want to say that, you know, we're looking to see maybe what tomorrow is going to bring. <laughs> 